The paradigm of bivalence belongs to the philosophical heritage of ancient Greek thought and its continuation in European philosophy. However, there have always been attempts to mitigate the radical nature of two-valuedness by introducing additional values. Radical bivalence can simplify things for philosophers and theologians who work with strict dichotomies such as true and false, sinful and virtuous, guilty and innocent, or good and bad. But this is not how people usually think. In almost all cases where people are confronted with two mutually exclusive options, they are able to find a third alternative, or at least introduce mitigations such as extenuating circumstances in court trials. And whenever great philosophical or theological systems are put into practice, they deviate from their radical bivalent principles. For example, Catholicism invented the idea of purgatory, and in Islamic theology there is the dimmy status of the so-called people of the book. The idea of intermediate values is as old as the systems of logic, but was only formalized in the many-valued calculi of the 20th century. One of the first was the ternary logic of Lukasiewicz. These many-valued calculi played a role in the development of a new epistemology after the Second World War. Instead of solely relying on simple cause-and-effect schemes, strict objectivity and linear scaling, Scientists began to work with cybernetics, nonlinear mathematics, fuzzy logic, and computer technology to analyze complex systems. In this video, I will present an attempt by the philosopher Gotthard Günther to develop a new non binary logic amidst this epistemological shift. While most many valued logics introduce only intermediate values, such as probabilistic logic, Günther has attempted to create a type of logic that allows for alternatives beyond the two extremes. The possibility of such a logic is explicitly ruled out by the third law of thought. However, there is an ambiguity in the third law that is crucial for understanding Günther's philosophy. To explore this further, we need to take a brief look at all three traditional laws of thought and their interrelationship. The first law states that an object is transcendent in relation to the various ways in which it can be experienced. It remains identical with itself, regardless of how it is thought. The law of identity thus refers to the objecthood of the object in general. The second law refers to how objects are conceived. We do not think of objects only abstractly. To think of an object always means attributing certain properties to it. In order to be conceivable, an object must be determinable. However, every determination has two sides, a positive and a negative one. When a positive determination is made, other determinations are always negated at the same time, and vice versa. As Spinoza said, omnis determinatio est negatio. Because of this implicit two-sidedness of all determinations, contradictory determinations must be excluded. For example, the cat is in this room implies the negative side, the cat is not outside this room. The third law further specifies the function of determination. It refers to the unity of the context in which the determination is made. This context includes all possible determinations of an object, that is, how an object can be determined from a certain viewpoint. It is not important whether the context as a whole can be fully defined. For example, the context of color can be precisely defined, while the context of impression of a landscape probably cannot. A determination is, therefore, always made against the background of a mostly unformulated context. An object must always be assigned one of the possible determinations within this context. For if I negate one of the determinations, I inevitably affirm others. In every context, position and negation are symmetrical. If I negate A, I get non-A, and the negation of non-A must bring me back to A. There is no logical operation that allows me to introduce a third option. Of course, there are other relations besides the contradictions between the objects of a context, but by adopting the most radical interpretation of the principle of bivalence in formal logic, an ambivalence regarding the third law becomes apparent. The problem with the third law is that it can be interpreted both relatively and absolutely. The third law refers to the closeness of the context 
but it does not specify whether a third option is temporarily excluded or simply does not exist. In other words, the context can be either relatively closed or absolutely closed. This ambiguity can be illustrated with a simple example. Something is either white or it is not white. There is no third alternative. This could mean that the object is either white or black. However, non-white could also encompass other colors, like red and blue, depending on the context. It could even mean that something has no color at all. When I apply the third law to the context of color, either the statement the flower is red or the statement the flower is not red must be true. This is not problematic because flowers are known to have a color. However, within the context of color, the statement the number 7 is either white or non-white is meaningless. It can only make sense if we shift to a context that includes colors as well as other properties, such as being a prime number. This is admittedly an unusual context, typically used only in rare cases, such as when answering a child's question or in a logical example like this one. But this procedure is based on the assumption that the law of the excluded third alternative has only relative validity. A third alternative is temporarily excluded and can be included by shifting to another context. From the viewpoint of radical two-valuedness, this is problematic because it creates a three-valued logic within each context with true, false and temporarily excluded statements. A third law with absolute validity, on the other hand, states that it is impossible to introduce a third option. It applies only if we abstract from any concrete context and assume the existence of a context that encompasses all contexts. This idea of a universal context is integral to any theory based on two-valued logic and one-valued ontology. Gotthard Günther called this context of all contexts the contexture. A contexture is an absolutely closed context in which the laws of thought fully apply. Yet he makes the surprising claim that there is not just one contexture, but many. We live in a polycontextual world. In the hopes of making this more understandable, I will first outline the theory of monocontextuality by referring to Plato's system of diaresis, and then examine the functional difference between context and contexture. Plato's diaresis is a strictly binary method of categorization that rests on a hierarchical structure of concepts. One begins with a general category and moves downward step by step to more specific ones. It was used by Plato to find the exact definition of a debated concept, such as what is a human or what is a statesman. While this approach had a significant influence on later systems of knowledge, it has many flaws, as already Plato's contemporaries pointed out. However, its simplistic binary structure makes it a fitting model for illustrating the idea of a monocontextual universe. The structure begins with the most general category, such as movement or animal, which encompasses all subordinate categories. Negating this topmost category results in a total negation, since it rejects the entire conceptual framework. In contrast, the binary divisions that follow introduce partial negations, which are always context-dependent. In his examples, Plato usually picks a general category, like art, that he sees as suited to the task at hand. However, his examples only focuses on a cutout of a monocontextual universal structure with the most general of all categories, that is being, at the top. But how can being be the final all-encompassing category if it still has the total negation of nothingness? Plato argued that the idea of pure nothingness is incoherent. Instead, he conceived of non-being not as absolute nothing, but as difference. In this view, non-being appears at the bottom of the hierarchy as a pure lack of being that is not a positive property in itself. This interpretation was further developed by Platonists and laid the theoretical groundwork for the highly influential theory of privation. The apex, or center, by contrast, represents the fullness of being, the central source from which all existence emanates. The further something stands from this ultimate principle of reality, the less being it possesses. So although there is the dualism of form and matter in Platonism, the latter only derives its limited form of being from the former. 
The theory of privation was not the only answer to the problem of negating the highest category. Another response comes from the philosopher Nicholas of Cusa and his concept of the coincidentia oppositorum. According to this idea, the highest category is beyond division and therefore cannot be negated. The coincidentia oppositorum represents the highest unity as a state where opposites merge and no longer stand in opposition. It transcends logical reasoning, which, according to Nicholas of Cusa, depends on the process of division and differentiation. Since a total negation leads to a second contexture, most philosophers either settled for dualism or, as in the case of Nicholas of Cusa, monism. According to Günther, this is because their worldview is based on a one-valued ontology and two-valued logic. The theory of polycontextuality, on the other hand, increases the number of total negations and therefore the number of contextures. Günther explained the difference between context and contexture using a simple example. Imagine a consciousness that can only perceive sounds. For this consciousness, everything that exists would be noise. Sound would be identical to being. This consciousness would be unable to communicate with another consciousness that is only aware of colors. They would require a third consciousness as an intermediary, one that can perceive both sounds and colors. In this example, we have two contextures between which there is a fundamental rift. A third contexture then transcends both, downgrading them to mere contexts. I can move up to a higher contexture, move down into a lower context, or jump to a completely different contexture. However, in the latter case, I would lose the content of the previous contexture. Here is another simple example to illustrate this. Suppose I am counting the birds on the tree outside my window. After counting three birds, I spot a cat. I can keep my count of three birds and add plus one for the cat by switching to counting animals instead of birds. Alternatively, I could start counting cats and lose my count of the three birds. Moving from one contexture to another can result in losing the content of the first, but by switching to counting animals, I can preserve the count of both cats and birds, maintaining the distinction between them by treating the former contextures as context. Furthermore, when an element is moved from one contexture to another, it loses its identity and adopts a new one. We wouldn't even recognize it as the same object. However, in a third contexture, there could be an element that combines the two. In this case, the third contexture provides a world in which the two elements are merely two different perspectives on the same object. Often, contextures are not fully incorporated by a third contexture. For instance, when two persons interact in a shared world. Person A and B each represent a separate contexture. However, they can communicate over the shared real world C. The scheme is strongly simplified since A, B and C are actually each a bundle of many contextures. In our daily lives, we constantly move between countless contextures and encounter discontextualities. However, we do not live in completely disconnected worlds. Because for every two elements, there is always a contexture that encompasses both elements at the same time. Just not one final, all-encompassing contexture. Yet, although we move seamlessly between contextures and can transform contextures into contexts, it is difficult to think of a contexture as contexture and not a context. The theory of polycontextuality posits that only the content of a contexture can be an object, and since a contexture can neither contain itself nor remain a contexture when included in another contexture, it cannot be an object. Perhaps it makes more sense to think of it as consisting of the relations between the things it encompasses. It is not a container, but rather a structure or an order. Maybe Wittgenstein had something similar in mind when he wrote in paragraph 5.632 of his Tractatus, The subject does not belong to the world. Rather, it is a limit of the world. Nevertheless, Günther was convinced that a new transclassical, many-valued logical calculus could to a limited extent, operate with contextures as contextures and with intercontextual relations. He still held on to the equivalence of ontology and formal logic, 
and, influenced by the advances of formal logic in the 20th century, tried to create a new mathematical logic for his theory of polycontextuality. However, he ultimately failed. On closer inspection, Günther's calculus can be reduced to a handful of permutations that add very little to symbolic logic and mathematics, and the calculus is far from capable of the remarkable things Günther claimed for it. Furthermore, cybernetics had no demand for his logic and developed in a remarkable way without it. Apart from these failures, and the fact that his texts are sometimes more confusing than illuminating, I think that his interpretation of the third law and his theory of the plurality of contextures provide a good link to my first video on the philosophy of logic and show a way to transcend two-valued logic. In upcoming videos I plan to present other philosophies that attempt to overcome the dualistic framework but that do not share Günther's ambition to integrate their theories into a new logical calculus.